in order of prayer. O Lord, open thou our hearts to hear, and through thy word to us draw near. Let us thy word heir pure retain. Let us thy children and heirs remain. Amen. The lesson that we're, we're going to reflect on today is that lesson from the end of John's gospel, John chapter 21, that we just shared with the kids. It's sort of an epilogue to John's gospel. It's the last resurrection account of Jesus as he showed himself after he was raised from the dead to the disciples. It's by the Sea of Tiberias, which was called the Sea of Galilee, but renamed by the Romans after their current emperor, Tiberius Julius Caesar, who was reigning at the time. And how the disciples got there to that sea? Well, that's what our text tells us. It's the second verse of that lesson, in John chapter 21, verse 2 and 3. It tells us that Simon Peter and Thomas, who's called the twin, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two of the other disciples were together. And Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples said, we'll go with you. Going fishing. I love to fish, but priorities in life the last number of years have prevented me from being able to spend much time at all fishing. My fishing gear has been high and dry for quite a while. But as I was telling the kids in the children's message, when I was little, I couldn't pass by a mud hole or a puddle without trying to catch something in it, even if it was a, a minnow or a crawfish. If I was at the discount store with my mom and she was busy shopping and I had a few moments, I made my way over to the fishing aisle so I could look at all the tackle and see what kind of lures I might be able to afford. I was eager for that next time I got together with my cousins at the river or the lake or the pond. Whenever we were together, we brought our fishing gear. And it helped that my grandparents lived on a lake. So if we had a family gathering, my cousins and I would disappear for the entire day, and oftentimes the results of our fishing trips were a lot like the disciples in this text for today from John chapter 21, the end of verse 3. So they went, got into the boat, and they fished all night and caught nothing, it says. Maybe it's because they're out of practice. Their fishing gear had been high and dry for quite some time, too. We know from the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that at least four of these disciples had been professional fishermen in their previous life. But it's been two to three years since that time. Because Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 tells us, immediately they left everything. They left their nets and they followed him. That him was Jesus. Three years ago, along the shore of this same lake, on that faithful day, when Jesus came along and said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Fishers of people. From that point, three years ago on, they had set their nets aside. All their fishing gear was put aside. In fact, they didn't do much fishing except for one time. Matthew chapter 17 tells us that just after the transfiguration of Jesus, they came down from the mountain and went back into town. And when they got back into town, the temple tax collectors were coming around to collect the temple tax, sort of like an obligatory offering. It's an offering that you had to pay because they collected it like a tax. And if you didn't pay it, well, then there were fines, not just monetary fines, but there could be spiritual fines that the priest would levy on you. And so they wanted to know if Jesus was going to pay his temple tax. Peter happened to be outside talking to them. Jesus was inside. And Peter assured them that Jesus would indeed pay his temple tax. Now this conversation wasn't lost on Jesus, even though Jesus was inside, presumably engaged in other activities, while Peter's outside having the conversation. But as soon as Peter came in the room, Matthew's Gospel in chapter 17 tells us, Jesus spoke first. And Jesus never missed an opportunity like this to teach his disciples about the kingdom of God. And so he went on to talk about how he being the Son of God, did not need to pay this temple tax because the kingdom of God already belongs to the children of God. But then Jesus told Peter, 
Matthew chapter 17, verse 27. But so as not to offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and the first fish that comes up, open its mouth, and you'll find a shekel. Take it and give it to them for me and for yourself. That's why it's been two to three years maybe since these disciples have been fishing. Three years they've been with Jesus, but was it just Peter who went fishing that day? Was it all the disciples? I don't know, but that's the last we hear of these disciples fishing until now, until John chapter 21, after the resurrection. Only it wasn't Jesus who told them to dust off their fishing gear this time. So why is it that they went fishing? Well, I don't know if there's a definitive answer to that question this morning, but I could think of some possibilities. And perhaps it's a way of escape. It's them getting away from the stress of the last several weeks that's been piling up ever since they were in the garden with Jesus when he was arrested. And then he was put on trial. And then he was crucified. And then they were hiding, afraid because their Savior had been killed. And, and then Jesus appeared to them and the joy of the resurrection. But it's, it's just overwhelming. It's a lot to take in. And they're finally emerging from their hiding. But they just need to get away and escape for a little while. Perhaps that's why they went just as an escape, just to get it. Or maybe it's a time of spiritual renewal and refreshment. It really helps me to get outside when I need some spiritual renewal. And they've been through a lot, so maybe this is a time to get outside into God's creation for a little bit of spiritual renewal for themselves, for they've been locked up in Jerusalem for a long time now. It's just time to, time to get away. Or maybe the anxiety is still with them. Maybe they're still stressed. Maybe they're still worried. Yeah, they know that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but the last thing that this risen Jesus said to them was, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. That was the previous chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus sent them to continue the mission and ministry that he had been doing. And now he disappeared, and he wasn't even going to be with them as they did it. And so maybe they're bearing all that stress and that worry and that anxiety about how are we going to carry out this ministry without him here. And so they just went for a distraction and get away from that worry for a while. Or maybe they're circling back to where this all started. Because as I mentioned, they started there with Jesus along that same seashore, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. And so maybe they're going back to renew their purpose. If Jesus is sending them to do this mission, they're going back there to get a sense of what was that mission and that calling in the first place? What does it mean to be fishers of people? And so they're back there to re renew that sense of calling or maybe they're back there because Jesus isn't there with them anymore and so who's going to provide the loaves of bread and the fish like at the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000? There's nobody to do that for them anymore so they're going to need to work for themselves. Jesus isn't there, so if they're going to carry out this mission of ministry, they've got to at least put some food on the table and so maybe they're going back to their previous calling and previous vocations. So they just dusted off all that fishing gear so that they could actually make some money. Or maybe they're going back to that previous calling and circling back because they don't feel like they can succeed in this new calling. As fishers of people, certainly for Peter, maybe he's feeling that way. Maybe he's feeling he's been such an utter failure at being a fisher for people, like in the courtyard of the high priest that night when Jesus was put on trial that he's decided to go back to something that at least he knows he's good at, fishing. Whatever the possibilities are, again, I don't know that there are any definitive answers as to why the disciples are there on that sea fishing that day. I just suggest these as possibilities because I know that these are the kinds of things that I do. And not to be too presumptuous, I'm going to assume that these are the kinds of things that you do too. Not that you go fishing, but that you need to escape sometimes from the stress and the tension of the previous weeks. And when you need to escape, where is it that you escape to? Is it a sewing room somewhere or a wood shop? Or maybe you just need a time of spiritual renewal too. So you need to refresh your spirit and remember who God is and where do you go for that? Do you go get out into creation as well? Is it a trail somewhere that you can walk or you can run? 
Oh, when speaking of running, do you do that too? Sometimes are you running away from anxiety that's still hounding you in life? And when you are being hounded by anxiety, where do you run to escape from it, to get away? Is it just a distraction to set it all aside? Is it the pages of a well-worn novel? Is it the plot of a best box office movie? Or sometimes do you need to circle back to a less complex time, back when you felt like you knew how to handle life and, and go back to something that you, you're sure you know how to do. What is that comfort vocation for you? That task you go back to because at least I know how to do this when you feel like a failure. I know I'm giving you lots of questions. I'm just throwing out lots of possibilities today and I'm giving very few definitive answers because I don't think we have a lot of definitive answers about why the disciples are out there fishing that day. Although there are a lot of commentaries and there are a lot of preachers who would spend time fishing for that one reason why the disciples went back, why Peter suggested that they should go fishing. But I'm not going to worry about that today because what I want you to see in this text of John chapter 21 is the comfort that I find in it. That Jesus came to them. Jesus came to them. Wherever they were, for whatever reason, they were out there that day. And Jesus knew exactly why each one of them was out there fishing that day. Whatever it was, Jesus came to them. And he prepared a little meal for them. It was some comfort food. It was bread and fish cooked over a charcoal fire. And then he hollered out to them and said, Children, do you have any fish? He knew they didn't have any fish. Why is he asking him that? Because he wants them to know that whatever they're fishing for, whether it's the tilapia in the Sea of Tiberias or whatever kind of fish it was, or if they're fishing for people or whatever vocation they're trying to accomplish something in, they're only going to be successful in it if he's the one providing for that success. And so Jesus hollered out to them again from the shore, Put the net on the right side and you'll find some. Why are they listening to this guy who's out on the shore anyway? What does he know about fishing? Unless they think it might actually be Jesus. They might have an inkling that it is because he's done this before. Y yeah, three years before when he first called them at the shore of this sea. When Peter and Andrew and James and John were there at their boats. Jesus told them where to put out their nets after they had a night full of catching nothing. And all of a sudden their nets overflowed. And so they did. They put their nets out on that right side of the boat. And all of a sudden they were so full of fish that they couldn't even haul them in, we're told in verses 6 and 7. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Simon Peter, It is the Lord! Now I imagine Peter was thinking this already. But this is John's gospel after all. And so from his perspective, he thought of it first. Even though Peter was the first one to respond to it. After he heard that it is the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had stripped himself to work, put on his outer garment and threw himself into the sea. Now, imagine if Peter had a confident faith at this point. He wouldn't have had to throw himself into the sea. He could have walked across that sea to Jesus. But Peter's not feeling confident in faith at this point. He's just overjoyed that Jesus hasn't forgotten about him and abandoned him. And so he swam his way to shore and left the rest of the disciples to deal with that amazing, miraculous catch. And it's not until they're on the shore and Jesus invites them to go get some of the fish that they had caught and add it to the breakfast he was providing when Peter remembers, oh, there are fish to take care of. And so then we're told later in that lesson that Peter goes and takes care of the nets and hauls them into the shore and then counts the fish, 153 of them. And we're even told the nets were not torn. Amazing. The last time this happened, three years ago, the nets were tearing because of the catch. But even more amazing is what Jesus did. Saying, come and eat. Jesus feeds them. Jesus encourages them. Jesus strengthens them. Jesus equips them. Come and eat. 
And then John tells us in our lesson that none of them asked, who are you? Because they all knew it was the Lord, which seems like an odd question to us. Why would they even think about saying that? Because they've been with him for three years. They know who he is, except that he died. And now he's alive again, so that might give them pause. But he's doing the same kind of things he did with them even before he died and was raised. The same thing he did when he fed the 5,000. The same thing he did when he fed the 4,000. And on presumably numerous other occasions, he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he took the fish and did the same. And in the background of this feeding is a story about a weary prophet named Elijah, seven or 800 years before who himself had been running away from ministry as an escape. Because of the tensions that were mounting in his life and the fears, he ran a day's journey into the wilderness and he laid down under a broom tree and a weary Elijah the prophet went to sleep. And an angel tapped him on the shoulder under that broom tree and said, rise and eat. And there next to him was some warm bread that had been baked over a hot stone and there was a jar of water. And he rose and he ate and he drank and he laid back down and went to sleep again. And the angel tapped him on the shoulder again after a nice long sleep and said, rise and eat. And there was the food again and he ate again. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 19 that after that, Elijah didn't need to eat for another 40 days and 40 nights because of the way he was strengthened by that meal. Now, I imagine in John chapter 21 that Jesus' disciples went on to eat again before 40 days and 40 nights were up. But I, I do believe that the spirit of the meal was the same. This is Jesus coming to them at a time when they are depleted and they are weary and they are spent and they are burnt out. And Jesus is feeding them, feeding them with his forgiveness, feeding them with his love feeding them with purpose. And he does the same for you and me. Wherever we run to, wherever we're escaping to, wherever we're going for distraction, wherever we're re needing a renewal to realize that, that we can actually do something well in this life, Jesus meets us there. and says, come and eat. And he, and he fills us with forgiveness and love and purpose and renews our sense of service to him. And that's what happens in the rest of this gospel lesson after our lesson ends. Our lesson ends there with Jesus feeding his disciples on the shore. And right after that, Jesus is going to take Peter aside who really needs reassurance. He's going to take him on a walk, just single him out. And they're going to walk together. And Jesus is going to reassure this disciple who denied him three times just a couple weeks ago, three times reassure him that Jesus has a purpose for him in ministry. And rather than dig into that today, I'll let you read that this week. Take some time. Read the rest of John chapter 21. But before you do, I have one more question. Where are you today? Yeah, I know you're in a sanctuary, you're sitting in church, you're listening to me. But, but where are you mentally and spiritually and vocationally? Jesus is calling. Children, do you have any fish? Oh. And he's prepared a meal. Just a little something for you and for me. Come and eat. In Jesus' name. Amen.